So welcome everybody. We are here on October 14th for the third meeting of the advisory team on policies and practices. Um, my name is Michelle Lisey. I'm the community engagement specialist for the city of Red Wing. And um, like I said, today we are here. We will have a public meeting for the full two hours. Anybody who wants to see the notes, anybody who wants to see the video, they can go to the advisory team page on the city's website. Um, it looks like we have almost everybody here. Um, I, and we'll hope that Cholaway joins us in a couple minutes. Um, with that, I will pass it to Dominique and she will, um, you know, welcome us and lead us into this third meeting. Hi, everyone. Um, so it's been a while since we've seen each other. Um, I do want to give some space and some time for us to get grounded. Um, and then jump into what the definition of ready will be and the definition of done for this meeting. So, um, before we sort of get into a grounding space, the definition of ready for this meeting is that you all have brought your maps um, and your grids, and you have taken a look at the roadmap and toolkit that Michelle have previously sent to you all. So, that's going to guide the conversation and the work that we do today as we move into calls for service um, and sort of working through the roadmap and making sure. That as we are looking at the different policies and practices for Red Wing, um, that we have the map to guide us and do this activity. That's the definition of ready for that. Everybody have their maps, grids. It's like school, I know, only we're here. Um, <laughs> anyways, and then definition of done will be that we've sort of reviewed and finalized the overall goals for how the team shows up and how the department plays a role in this process. Because I know that that has sort of been clarity that both sides have been asking for. Um, also really getting grounded in what the last um, series of meetings will be, because I know we have October, two in November, and then one in December before we take a holiday break. And so we wanna be able to make sure that we have one, have met one substantial goal or had one substantial piece to um, inspire us to continue the work uh, as the new year sort of comes. And so I want to be cognizant and make sure that that's happening as well. And then we'll be really finalizing what we are hoping to get out of this team and how we are to move forward. So those are the key pieces for this, for this call. And we'll go over all of those things, of course, to meet that definition of done. I want to sort of acknowledge just everybody here in this space and, and what has happened since we last met and what's to come. I know we're all sort of in an election space right now. Um, we're in COVID. It's sort of the numbers are rising in terms of COVID cases, the numbers of, you know, um, ways in which people are facing violence is, is increasing. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that. And so a lot of the work that we do is emotional. A lot of the work that we're going to do is emotional because talking about uh, systemic issues and systems is emotional work. Um, and it's emotional at the point that you've had these lived experiences. And so your lived experience plays a lot in how you show up for yourself and others. And I wanna acknowledge that. What I don't want it to do and, and what I am hoping that we can sort of move forward with is that we're here to talk about the policies and the practices, um, and we want to stay focused on that. And so I think that this activity will really help us to get to the work, because I know a lot of people are really anxious to get to the work. What I will caution, though, is the notion that this is a one-time deal and that we'll do this activity and we'll solve everything and then we'll <laughs> move forward. <laughs> it's a long process, um, and you're not the first city to do this, nor will you be the last, I think what you have to stay true to is the needs of your community and making sure that where you meet this moment is as good as you're going to give the effort and the care to the folks that are in this work with you um, in the community, in the department, and, and everywhere that we can be with each other virtually. So manage our expectations, settle yourselves, but know that um, there is work to be done and we're going to get to it. All right. So with that, I'm going to pass it on over. Um, welcome, Mayor. Um, and I will give you the floor. I'm going to meet well, myself. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, welcome, advisory team, for your third meeting. And welcome to all who are listening or viewing th their important work. 
Uh, I applaud you all for engaging in a series of difficult conversations and improving the city's practices and policies so that the local government could, works well for everyone. So last week, you probably know, uh, the city received a letter of resignation from one of the advisory team's police department representatives. The city council accepted it and we acknowledge his choice. I and the city council believe that our community has a great opportunity to lead by example with the advisory team and your work that we need to hear the messages from all residents and find a path forward that strengthens local and government and community. The council has brought you the advisory team together with our police department representatives, our community engagement specialists, and with, knowledge, with the knowledgeable facilitation of Dominic Johnson to have the hard and productive conversations needed by our community and the city. We know we are not perfect and that we are not always welcoming to every individual, but I am convinced we are all committed to making Red Wing the best it can be. So with that, welcome again. Thank you for joining up on this uh, really important effort. I turn the meeting back to Dominique uh, to begin tonight's conversation and have a great meeting. Thank you. All right. How are we all feeling tonight? Everybody looks very somber. So I just want to get a temperature check. All exhausted? Yes, no? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> so, so. All right. So let's get to work. Um, Michelle, take it away for us in terms of getting our goals and responsibilities and, and the way in which we're going to sort of move into this. And then I'm really excited because um, we did the service call activity with another city recently, and it was sort of a success. So I'm excited to see how your city aligns with some of the other work that we've been doing recently. Um, and I think it'll be really cool. So Michelle, I'm gonna pass it over to you and then we can dive in after you're ready. Good, thank you. Melissa, can you please give me the, um, I don't know. Melissa's like our Wizard of Oz behind the camera here and she's gonna give me the presentation. Okay, so what we're gonna do is um, just run through, it's a PowerPoint, so big warning, it's a PowerPoint. Don't, don't fall asleep on me, um, but, Oops. Am I sharing that? Can you see that? Yes, okay, I'm looking at Juan. He's giving me the thumbs up, thank you. So let's just go through and really um, what this is, it will not take very long, but it kind of frames up why we're here, what we're gonna do. Um, I will do the first two thirds of it. Dominique will lead us through the end and it really goes through what is gonna happen during the rest of 2020. So this is a policy and practice project. And the goal is right there, improving inequitable systems so government works better for everyone. If you run into somebody on the street and they say, what the heck are you doing? What is this for? You could just sort of, this is, this is really it. Um, we can go through if people have, have problems or issues with that, we can definitely discuss it, but this is how we're laying this out, policy and practice project and it's improving inequitable systems so government works better for everyone. It is a multi-year project, and I know you all know this, but this is for the team, but it's also for the public who might be watching. Um, it was started by city council. It stemmed from city council in the summer of 2020, and the purpose is to identify and improve government policies and practices that are specifically negatively affecting some residents, especially residents of color. It's important that we call that out so I just wanted to, um, you know, we'll go through this. The project strives to help Red Wing become a more sustainable, healthy, accessible, resilient, and equitable community where every person feels at home. That is the city's mission that is written on um, throughout 20, the 2040 plan, and it's written on um, the 10 year strategic plan. You notice Chola Way is in this shot and um, there was a really fun welcome video and some of these wonderful people uh, came together. And so I can send all that, that, that video to you if you'd like. Again, it's important to also know that this project did not just come out of 
nothing. And it, um, although it stemmed and the conversation really started getting focused after the death and murder of George Floyd. But the city of Red Wing does have these three key plans that it has had and it has been working toward goals. And so it's important for people to know it's the 2040 community plan, the 10 year strategic plan and Red Wing's racial equity plan. And all of these talk about the work that you all um, and that the city itself will be working on over these next few years. Hmm. This is also listed the statement on our on the website and it's important for people to know that the city of Red Wing acknowledges that institutional and systemic racism and the bias of white privilege exists in policies and practices throughout society, including every level of government. And we at the city feel that it's really important just to acknowledge that to say it to write it and to have it available for everybody to see. Minnesota has one of the country's largest quality of life disparities between white residents and residents of color. I know this is no surprise to anyone um, and much has been written about it um, over the years and especially now, but this is one important reason and here we sit right in the middle. Eliminating systemic racism requires understanding and focusing on systems and policies, not individual people. These are two things because we talk a lot in this group about policies and practices. So it's really, you know, important to know what they are. And so the policy, a policy is a written guideline that helps the city follow through with its laws. Sometimes we call them rules. Sometimes we call them procedures. It's really, it is written down. So it, it's, it's more formal. A practice is something that we don't want to forget about. We might talk a lot about policy, but practice is really the way that people work in their day to day environment. So it is that informal way. And all of us who have families, school, work, we know what this means. It's sort of whatever it does to create the culture within that department or that institution, that company. Um, so we, we are looking both at the policy, the formal and the written and the practice, the way that we do our everyday work. So systemic racism, again, defining really refers to the systems in every facet of life that perpetuate racism, either intentionally or unintentionally. But often we have really used these systems for so many years that they're kind of baked into the way we do things. And so it happens whether or not people realize that it's happening or not. Some people are very aware of it, some people are not. Um, in fact, so that's what in the second paragraph, the organizations in charge of the systems may not see or understand how they're furthering those inequities uh, that ultimately lead to those wide disparities in health, economics, education, and well being. So, as you all know, you know, being successful in this work requires a community based approach, and at the center must be residents who sometimes or often experience negative aspects of, in this case, government policies and practices. And so the advisory team is a group of 12 residents of varying ages, backgrounds, and experiences to help government um, and those also who live in this community who may not experience those negative um, sides, open up people's eyes and, um, you know, to, to make this a, a successful project and to make sure the goals are accomplished. I'll turn it over to Dominique and she can go through um, the last piece of this. Everybody's roles, including you all. All right, so everybody can play a role in this project. The goal here is that the advisory team is going to be understanding the policies and the systems to be able to make the recommendations necessary to inform the public um, their community members and constituents and to inform the council, the city staff and work with all of the systems in play to be able to move the needle in providing equitable systems for everyone. As this is a multi year approach, of course, we're starting with policing and the hope is that we will be able to put the baton over to the next sort of advisory team to do the same thing, but in a different sector um, here in Red Wing. 
So we want to be able to identify and improve these inequitable policies and practices. Um, what I don't want people to think is that we're here to do the same old thing. If you're not understanding the systems at play in your community, Red Wing, then you're not going to be able to make the changes that you want to see here. And it's different in every sort of area that I've been in with my work throughout the center, that everyone is hearing the national rhetoric, they're thinking of these national conversations, and they want the one size fits all solution. It doesn't work like that. It's not going to work like that. And the expectations are that community should be leading this process and everyone should be listening and learning about the experiences of community members as they move this work forward. Um, when you're thinking about policing, it has to be really specific though and thinking about and understanding policing as the system right now currently, and then how we can work together with our law enforcement partners to reduce the, the footprint of uh, law enforcement in areas where they were not particularly designed to be because a lot of the spaces where law enforcement has been have been a stopgap for the different sort of uh, lack of responsibilities and services that governments could provide and so we just want to get back to understanding where are the needs that community need um the, the government to play a role and then who in these different systems actually play that role and how do they show up to support communities. Uh, next slide. Hmm. I don't Maybe know. There's no other side. No, there, there we <laughs> PowerPoint's go. over. Everybody yeah. go home. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, actually, no. So, so this is just the parts of the team during phase one. So, as I said, I've been here to help you all through phase one. We have the wonderful advisory team here. Uh, we have Michelle and myself, and then we have the, the police department staff leads who are going to be here. Chief and training officer Corey uh, will be here to help this process. Again, everyone is here to decide and learn more about how the system currently functions and then what is it that we need to do to ensure that the system is equitable for all. So understanding those policies and practices and, and making them policies and practices that are equitable to every uh, citizen in Red Wing. Next slide, please. Oh, and now, and then we turn this over to the mayor and the city council to sort of take these recommendations and implement them in a way, again, that is equitable and community centered. Um, so the power is all in the community and the ways in which we work with the different agencies and systems in Red Wing to do that. So step one, as we always say, I'm telling everybody all the time, systems, 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 how do systems work? How do the systems currently function? So how is the police department currently functioning? How do different communities experience those systems? Uh, are they negatively impacted? Are they positively impacted? What agency and power do these different communities have when interacting with this particular system? Currently, it is the policing system in Red Wing. Thinking about the best options through evidence-based approaches. So what we're gonna be doing tonight is looking at calls for service. CPE released a roadmap for uh, new models of funding public safety. And the first step in that process, it's a six step process, is looking at calls for service. Calls for service are really important as you'll see tonight because this is where you can identify the stop gaps for where law enforcement has sort of been pushed into enforcement from the systems that are no longer designed to be able to cover and meet the needs of communities to protect or serve those folks when it comes to mental health or other social services that we have sort of moved from one system to another to meet the needs of the community. Um, and then step four would be recommending these changes and having the city council make the decisions. So it's up to our team to really put our pens to paper, get these recommendations in place, and then ensure and sort of um, and sort of give these recommendations to the city council to say, hey, let's implement these, let's do this. This is evidence-based, we want to do this. And in the middle there you see, assume good intent by all. As I've said before, everyone is coming from this from their lived experiences. And so what some people may have experienced has been burdensome policing and other people may not. It doesn't mean that one person has a more valid experience as a community member in Red Wing than another. 
It means that you all are lived community members in Red Wing. And if the system is not equitable for everyone, the system needs to be examined and policies and practices need to be put in place or changed so that the system is equitable for everyone. Next slide. So, as I always again say, <laughs> It is a very challenging time. COVID is wearing me out, guys, and I'm sure that it is wearing you out in terms of not being able to leave your homes, um, having to wear masks everywhere, living in a virtual reality, and not being able to do this work in person. It's really difficult. It makes connecting really hard. You're exerting a lot of energy to come and show up on a virtual stage to do this work, and it is really challenging. But we must acknowledge that we're here because there is a, a direct correlation to the, the violence that is happening to black and brown communities during COVID and throughout you are, COVID is really illuminating all of the inequities that exist that are negatively and directly impacting black and brown communities and other vulnerable communities. And so we have to acknowledge that uh, and it's evident everywhere you turn. And I think it's even more uh, in your face because we're in our homes and because we're consuming the news and, and it's challenging. But that doesn't mean that we cannot turn this sort of moment of unprecedented challenge into change. Next slide. So I've been hearing a lot of people talk about how and the team, there was sort of this space of it's too much emotion and people, we can't move forward, we can't move forward. One, we do have to give people the space and time to channel that emotion into actionable, impactful, and sustainable policy change. It is okay to come with your lived experiences and to have those emotions. Again, lived experiences are lived experiences and we validate them as such. What we need to do is commit to finding common ground and showing respect through the discussions, disagreements, and dialogues and allow everybody the space to share their lived experiences as community members and Red Wing to be able to make this sustainable, actionable policy change. Next slide. So we have, this is a sort of a roadmap of where we've been for 2020. Um, meeting one, meeting two, of course, was setting the tone and ground rules, working through the policing 101 for the last meeting, this meeting is going to really get into finalizing the roles and purpose because I know people want to be very clear on that. Um, looking at the demographics of Red Wing and situating ourselves in the city of Red Wing and then mapping these activities for calls for service. As I said, the roadmap for CPE talks about calls for service because calls for service will allow you to then understand where you can reduce the footprint. So let's say if we are looking at mental health, tonight we'll look at mental health calls for service. Calls for service for mental health will then allow us to go into meeting four and learn from local experts around how other entities could collaborate on addressing mental health. So if we decide that there are too many service calls in a particular area, what services and organizations are in that area that could meet the need if we were to say as a recommendation, we don't want mental health to be serviced in district five this way. So that's where we're going to be going. And so meeting four and meeting five, we'll be doing that, learning from the local experts, talking about ways of reducing the footprint through collaborative um, input on how we handle the different service calls, reviewing the best practices in other cities and discussing what would work best for Red, for Red Wing. And then the hope is that we would all really get consensus and discuss um, one policy proposal to bring to the city council in early 2021. What I do also want to um, put in as a bug in your ear for more meetings four and meetings five, um, there has been talk around policy for the department itself with Lexipol. Lexipol is a service that departments contract out to help write policy in the, in the short version of it. What Chief Pullman and I have sort of talked about is how we can make this a community centered process by thinking about is Lexipol the right sort of response for policies in Red Wing? Because the thing about a blanket policy is that it is not community centered. And so we are going to go more into that as well. But 
we want to think about how we want policies to be written in Red Wing for the department. And the chief is going to be instrumental in giving us the different options to be able to decide how we want our policies to be written because the policies really determine the enforcement. And so that's key. So tonight, let's really dive into the service calls to find out how Red Wing's department is actually showing up for the community, where they're showing up, why they're showing up, and what alternatives to showing up could look like. And then let's think about if we're looking to change policies in Red Wing, what alternatives or um, sort of avenues can we explore that are lexical or adjacent that could meet the community needs for creating the policies that they hope to enact. So I think this is the last slide, right? Or no? Yes. Yep. That's it. Yes. It is. Okay. So I could, um, Dominique, uh, I can go right into um, our next piece on demographics of Red Wing. Wait, let, let's take a second for okay. for everybody. That was a lot of information. Lot. And before it we was... before we dive in <laughs> there, I want to sort of get the temperature check on Stop sharing everyone's faces to see. There we go. Is that from the last time we all talked? Does that make sense in terms of where we're going? So we're looking tonight, we're going to look at these service calls. When we look at these service calls, we're going to determine based upon the different demographics of Red Wing and where the department is showing up, is this sustainable? Is this the right sort of space to do that? And if not, let's identify who's coming to our next two calls to tell us about where we can partner and collaborate to move some of the needle here in this work. And in the in adjacent parallel to that, we need to be really looking at policies. So if we're going to say mental health is something that we really want to take out of these service calls grid tonight, we want to change the policies around mental health and Red Wing. Let's work with the chief to find Lexapro, Lexa, Lexapol, sorry, Lexapol and the different alternatives to policy making because that's going to be crucial into how people then show up for service calls. If the policy is the department shows up in this way, this is directly tied to how the service calls will be logged, how this, what kind of service calls the department will do, and if they even take those types of calls anymore. Policies directly influence that. So that's the long-term game. But tonight, let's focus on looking to see where Red Wing's department is showing up and how they're showing up and what they're showing up for. All right. Oh, question. Okay. I think Doug has a question. Yeah. Where's uh, where are the three officers before? Is it uh, Officer Beck? Is he no longer with us? Correct. Or not not able to come tonight? Or he's Officer Beck is the one who resigned. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. he's yeah. he resigned. Yes. And so I think yes. that, yeah, so it's, there will be two, Chief Pullman and um, Officer Corey, and um, we're going to go ahead with two. All right. Questions, comments, thoughts? Okay. Michelle, take it away. Okay. So um, some questions, we asked all of you questions. Those are being answered. We don't want you to think that we just had to ask a bunch of questions and then where the heck are the answers? So um, some of the answers will be in tonight's presentation. Some we can send an email that would also be public on the website with with um, additional answers to those. So those will just be titled, you know, answers to the advisory team's questions. One question that quite a few people asked was um, they wanted to know what does Red Wing look like today? What are the demographics of Red Wing? And um, some folks might remember in 2017 and 18, the city did its first report card. And now with the census, you know, wrapping up, there will be all new data um, and there will be a really fantastic digital uh, report card that anyone could go on at any time in 12 different categories, including public safety, where you can look up some of the, the data. Today, we will, um, I will share this again. 
and we'll go through what the 2019 data is. So I will just close this and <laughs> get all this ready. This is why I don't do this as very often. Okay, that's the mapping. Just hang with me, everybody. Okay, data, there we go. Can I think Michael that? has a question. Okay, should we go back? Is it about data or should we go back, Michael? Gotta go back, it's kind of piggybacking off of Mr. Larson. Okay. Um, I'm just actually see here. curious on why Mr. Bedich isn't a part of a, um, our advisory team anymore, because if I remember correctly, uh, transparency is a big key with all this, with this whole team we got together. So that's what I wanted to know is what's up with Mr. Bedich. So no, one, there we go. no one knows what happened. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Because you guys had a council meeting on Monday. So no one on the team knows what happened. I thumbs think down. okay. So to be transparent, he doesn't believe in this process. And it is what it is. He does not believe in the process. And if you don't believe in the process, you can't be effective because you don't want to collaborate. And that's not a knock on him. I don't know him personally. Um, I know that there is a resignation and I know that the chief and his team who are here are committed to being here and we spoke about it and chief, you can chime in and, and sort of talk about that, but I don't want that to derail us from what we're here to do because I've gotten messages from people around how we show up. Some people are in my inbox that it's too much emotion. Some people are saying it's not enough passion. You're not going to be able to please everybody. So what I think is important for us to do is to start getting to the work and letting you all see what is happening in your community based upon the data. And if we do this activity and you understand what's happening, you're able to sort of plot your own decisions around what you are seeing and what you're actually doing. Because there was a conversation the last time about the inaccuracy or maybe the confidence that the data is actually what the data says. So this activity will allow you to map it yourself. You can see where the calls are, where they're showing up, how people are showing up and what's happening. And then you have the, the information you need to make informed decisions that will then lead the conversations in this group. What I do not want to do is give power to anyone who doesn't believe that this isn't a need. And the resignation was a clear condemnation of the fact that racism doesn't exist in Red Wing. I don't know. I've never been to Red Wing. Waiting to get there, COVID stopping me. What I can tell you is that I that there are systems and policies in place that are oppressive to some, and maybe other people don't have that lived experience. Not my problem. I do not want us focusing on that because that takes away the power of the group and the ability to be able to be here to make change. And so what I would encourage us all to do is to focus on doing this activity so that by the end of the year, we have recommendations that will accurately reflect the fact that there are disparities, whatever the disparities may be, there are, and there are people that are facing these systems differently. And here are the recommendations to ensure an equitable balance to that. And so I would encourage you all to do that questions, comments, thoughts, like I don't want to over talk people's space, but I also don't want us to get derailed by something that we cannot change. We well, can't guess, change it. It's nothing we can I, do about it. I guess basically what I was asking with that question is, did he resign from the advisory board or the police or the police department? Because if he doesn't believe in the process, but he's still a police officer, that's kind of that kind of makes situations worse. Like, you know, if I, how do I know I can trust him if he doesn't believe in the process and he's still an officer? Say we cross paths here and here in town one of these days. 
knowing that he doesn't believe in the police advisory council, I mean, I don't know how he's going to act towards me. Well, I, I don't know, Chief, if you want to talk just a couple minutes about, you know, I, I think the department is committed to the process, but I hear, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, and I want to yeah. be respectful of uh, Officer Baddick and other members of the department yeah. also is that I believe they believe in the desired outcome, but I think some think there may be different paths on how to achieve that and may not agree with the current direction that uh, we're looking at. So I, I wouldn't say that they don't uh, necessarily believe in the outcome, but uh, he's a professional officer. I'm proud of this department. And for us um, citizens to think that we're not going to put their needs first and to serve our citizens to the best of our ability um, would be a misnomer. So I, I want to definitely assure that. And we have eight common value words that I expect all my officers to live up to. And that's being accountable, consistent, uh, compassionate, fair, uh, integrity, respectful, teamwork, and professional. Uh, so those are our expectations in service to the citizens. And if we ever stray from that, we definitely want to hear about those concerns so that we can look into them and make corrective actions where needed because the citizens are the heart of any police department. And if we're not meeting the needs of our citizens, all of our citizens, then uh, we need to recheck what we're doing. And I believe this department at its heart does try honestly to meet the needs of all the citizens. So I'll leave it at that. All right. Anybody else have anything to say before we jump into the work? All right, Michelle, do you wanna go ahead? Try this again. It does take a couple minutes for my computer to um, pop out, but okay. So this is just diving in a little bit to the demographics. Um, as you know, we're starting to examine and learn from data. Always, a lot of it comes back to data. Calls for service. Here's what I either here's how I always think about it. We why do we even look at data? It's because we measure what matters. And so at the city or any entity, really, a school, a business, if you're not looking at the data, you might put all of your resources into the wrong issue. So looking at data, along with listening to people's experiences, helps us figure out where the problems are, where the disparities and gaps are so that we can actually take the money and the time and all of our energy and put it to the right spot. Because otherwise, we might be trying to fix something that doesn't need it or isn't going to work. So that's why we're digging into the data. And it's also really important to know that that's why we as a city want to dedicate time and effort to having our report cards always up to date, because if we're not measuring what matters, then we might not even know ourselves what we're telling ourselves what matters. And so you all are here to tell us what matters in public safety, really what matters to Red Wing. And then we can put things toward that and measure it to see if we're making a difference or not. So one of the questions you guys asked was, what is the most recent information just on the demographics? You know, these are just basic facts. These are just things. This comes from uh, the US Census and the American Community Survey does these um, five year estimates for smaller communities like Red Wing. We will get the, the total census, the 2020 census information next year. But this comes from 2015 to 2019. They compile that for communities our size. So Red Wing is slightly decreasing in population. We're down to 16,320. 
Um, age, no surprise here for any of us who live here. We are an aging community. One out of five of us are already 65 and older. Okay. That's 21.3%. You can see over on the right hand side of the screen 21.3 compares to Minnesota as a whole has 16.3% over age 65. So Red Wing in general is um, an aging community. Um, you see under 18 years is 22.1. So not quite, not quite a quarter of us are 18 or under. Racial and ethnic diversity, one in 10 of us is a person of color and one in four of our school district kids is a student of color. When we did this in 2017, it was one in five. So you can see how quickly that's changing with our young people. Um, same with our Hispanic Latino population. When we looked at um, statistics back in 2016, 17, this was just under 5%. Now it's five and a half, so that's growing. The black community, African American is um, 2.3%. American Indian, Alaska Native is 2.2. Two or more races, 3.7. Still kind of strange how the census, you know, we could get into a big debate. We won't tonight about how they divide these up and these labels. Um, and then there are two measurements for white. On the left, it'll show you the white that includes Hispanic Latino. And that's a choice that people can check. And that's almost 90%. The 89.5% are white, which includes Hispanic Latino. White that does not include Hispanic Latino is 86.7%. And then Asian is 0.8. And you'll see at the bottom, foreign born, relatively low, 3.6%. Um, I can stop here if there are any questions about this. Okay. Income and poverty. So the median household income, household, not individual, but the median household income is 53,154. 14%. And this has stayed fairly flat for the last three years. 14% of us live in poverty. And that is defined, at least in Goodhue County, as if you have a family of four and you make $24,000 or less, you technically, that's, that is their benchmark. That may change with the census numbers that are coming out, but right now that's how poverty is defined, and 14% of us live there. A living wage. You can go on the MIT living wage calculator. Anybody can do it at any time. It is a pretty cool and very easy tool to use. This is for two working adults taking care of two children in Goodhue County. If you are two adults and you're both working and you're taking care of two kids, you would each have to make 16.46 per hour. That changes radically if you are a single parent taking care of one child single parent taking care of two children, single parent taking care of three. And so you can go on that calculator and you can see how much do I need to make in Goodhue County to actually provide a living wage or, you know, for my family to, to have that. So it is a, um, it's a good tool. A couple more things, housing. Um, lack of housing has really risen to one of Red Wing's top concerns. The home ownership rate is 67. And renter tenant rate is 33. So basically, one third of the people who live in Red Wing are tenants, two thirds own their own home or have a mortgage. When we talk about who is cost burdened, and that is a phrase, that's a term that's used, you'll see it when you, there's so much great data that different um, sources use, and we can send that out to you so that you would, if you're interested, Minnesota Compass, the U.S. Census, there are a lot of great tools. You'll see this term cost burden, and that means if you pay more than one third of your income on your housing, whether it's rent, mortgage, your, your utilities, if you pay more than one third of what you bring in on just having a roof over your head, you would fall into that category of being cost burdened. And that's almost half of our renters. 46% of renters in Red Wing fall into that category and a quarter of our homeowners, that's high. Um, the median sale price of a home, 191, 191,250. The median monthly rent. We've heard from people when we talk about this 825. Some people, you know, 
say that's way, way, way too high, that's not right, or it's way too low. Um, this is what the US Census tells us, so this is what we use. And for this particular time between 2015 and 2019, it was 825 is the median monthly rent. That may also change because we've got a lot more housing units coming soon. And the monthly mortgage, 1,257. One more on housing. Um, this is the homeless and those at risk of, of being homeless. This comes from Hope Coalition. They keep their numbers every year. Actual homeless people, 58 people, those at risk of being homeless. So those being helped, 92. And Hope would also say, and they, I'm sure, will come in and speak to us and to our group here um, about a lot of different things. They would say that that number is also low. That that number doesn't necessarily count all the uh, kids who are couch hopping, kid families who have found a place with their aunt or uncle or grandparent. Um, these are people that they, you know, this is what Hope Coalition has counted. It's still low for the people who are at risk. And then just so people know this, the new housing units built in 2019 was 134 individual units. You know that there's um, the Keller Bartman project going up by Mayo Clinic. That will be, there will be many more units showing in 2020 that are provided. Hopefully that gives people some more options. Vacant residential lots. I'll just say that um, even a lot of us in the city were really surprised by this. 339 vacant lots. That doesn't mean that everything is perfect, that the grass is growing, but it means that there is water and sewer. And if you wanted to, you could buy that lot and you could build a house on it. With the river, the bluffs, the parkland, and a lot of our green space, there isn't a lot of extra space in Red Wing to build, but we do right now have 339 vacant lots. I think this is the last one. Um, there's so much data that you can that we can share and we will be doing a better job of doing that. But right now, um, the percent who've completed high school, um, almost 95 percent percent with a bachelor's degree, not quite a quarter of us percent with a computer. Pretty, I guess I, I'm not here to make judgments. It's, you know, you could say it's high, but for the people who don't have that, that makes a big difference. Um, percent with broadband connectivity, which is huge, as we all know now with our kids trying to learn from home, 80.5% have broadband. But for those 20% who don't, that's a that's a big deal. Um, our Goodhue County Health and Human Services has a wealth of information and data on health. So I did not even try um, to share all that. We can definitely give you all the places where you can go, learn about all the data. You know, for people, I, I find data fascinating, so, but, it's good to know that people under 65, okay, that's under 65 with the disabilities, 8.1%, and under 65 without health insurance, 8.4. The only thing I wanted to show you, and I, I'm not going to um, really go into it tonight, I'm very excited about this new Red Wing report card. It This gives you a little tiny glimpse of what this will look like. But we have 12 categories in the 2040 plan. One is housing and neighborhoods. One is public safety. One is community connections, accessible leadership. There's a lot. Each thing, a group of people from a lot of different areas of the city come together and say, what do we think is the most important, for instance, in housing, home ownership rate. And then if I had a pointer or if we were in the same room, I would show you that down below, if you look in that turquoise box, do you see this little current box? That says that's at 67. Then it tells you what the trend is here. There's a bar that says it needs improvement. And then if you click on this, oops, oh, I just messed up. Didn't I? Do you guys see a blank screen oh, there? Okay, sorry. If you would click this um, trend, If you would click this box that says trend, it would show you over time what Red Wing has done. So you can say if that 67 is high, low, in the middle, are we even making a difference with what we're trying to do? If we keep trying to do things and our numbers keep going in the opposite direction of what we wanna do, we're obviously not doing what we should do. So let's take a look at that and figure out what we're doing wrong. 
Same with this cost burden of housing. We explain what it is. We have the stats here for the current. You click on trend. It shows you what the trend is. And then there's this category in each of them, why we care. Why do we even care about this? And there's just a very brief paragraph to let people know why that makes a difference. So um, I just wanted to know this is coming. I'm in early 2021 and you all will be very helpful in helping the community know what should we be saying in terms of public safety. If we're measuring what matters, what matters to us. Um, okay. That's what I've got there. Melissa, I think you can take back the. You can take back the presentation so I don't mess things up anymore. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions on the data right now? It was just kind of some information. Is there anything surprising that you found or anything that is of interest? Michael? The 339 residential vacant lots, you know, because I mean, the homelessness and just people who are having issues with finding viable and reliable roof over their heads, but there's almost 340 vacant lots and nobody can find a place to live. Well, but I, just, yeah, I, I probably need to make sure that I said that right, Michael, because it's vacant. So literally you'd have to build a house on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure I was, so it's not a, it's not 339 houses, but yeah, I agree with you. I just want to make sure. Yeah. I mean, that's still a lot. We give 340 lots that could be used for equitable resource for this community. So. Yeah. I agree. I'm going to, the service calls is going to help with some of that. Choloway, Samantha. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, yes, they could be there, um, but I've heard and I looked into the lots in Red Wing. The problem we are having in Red Wing, I'm, ju I'm just going to say what I know a little bit about that, is uh, you, you could, uh, somebody can buy the lot, but uh, at this moment to bring a builder to put a structure here in Red Wing, and be able to maybe rent that house out, very, very expensive. And a lot of people will not afford, which means the developer who is the person buying the lot and building is gonna make a loss and maybe end up in foreclosure. So it's kind of a trail because of the 800 rental is a red wing. It's not affording people to be able to Build good homes and rent them to people, and maybe triples all the jobs in Red Wing, and much many people that rent. Mm -hmm. So, well, I just want to comment. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Sam. Um, I also wanted to talk or just mention the median monthly rent. I found that number to look extremely um, low. Um, I was just kind of curious if we know if that's one bedrooms, if it's a house, is it, is it apartment, is it a four bedroom with a yard? Like how, how are we finding that median number? because um, I found that number to be really low, if you ask me personally. Mm -hmm. um, and also the, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. The, peop the homeowners versus the renters numbers. Um, I think that looking into not only, but why people, some people aren't, aren't buying a house not because they can afford it, but they literally just can't find somebody to help them get a homeowner's loan because out of high school, they weren't prepared for life and their credit just won't allow them to do that. 
And I think trying to find a way for resources to be available to some people in order to get their credit back on track or find, you know, a different way for for people to use or find, you know, the resources to to eventually own a home. It might not be because they can't afford it, but it's because nobody will let them afford it. And that's where we'll go into like the community services. So that could be something as to tie it back to sort of the policing aspect of it. When we're looking at service calls, what you will probably find is that certain neighborhoods have different levels of engagement. And if you then identify that, and then you identify, oh, well, in this neighborhood, there are actually viable lots or there are viable resources that we haven't tapped into, then it ties into the policy aspect of how do we then work with our city council to give recommendations around implementing and uplifting these programs and services that people can offer but don't have the funding to do so. So it's sort of like a multi-tiered approach. And I would just say, I think being able to do the work that we do here when it comes to the policing aspect will open the doors for the second baton when it comes to housing and the other resources, because all resources are sort of community centered and collected. You just have to get the uplift, the ones that are doing this bucket of work to be able to finance them so that they can then pour into the communities. And Sam, I'll get that answer to you, to the group. I'll put that sort of on our answers. How did they find that? How, how are, with the rent? It's good to know how they how the U.S. Census counted that. Yeah. And Sarah, I think, had a question. Sarah, did you? Okay, I did. This isn't really necessarily specific to policing, but we're on the subject. And I wrote myself a note um, while Michelle was talking about reaching out to the city council. I've seen um, two of the last. I don't know if the last projects, but two recent housing projects, there's been kind of a sticking point with city council to make sure there's two parking spaces per unit. And that is taking a privilege into account and not necessarily affordable housing. Because if we're wanting to house people who are living in homelessness or living in poverty, most of the time those folks don't have two cars. So why are we putting that as a stopping point to building affordable housing or units? when the people who need the housing the most, most likely don't need two parking spaces. So just to have that in mind and. But it does tie into policing in the sense of when you guys are trying to understand policies and systems, right? So if you're trying to understand why certain policies are enacted or put in place, the more data that you have around these different sort of entities or, or blockages, then you can say this policy is preventing this to happen. And here is the resource that we would want to uplift to make sure that this doesn't happen to exclude people. So the same thing you're sort of pulling into when you're thinking about policing is that when we move into service calls, you're going to look at these service calls and you're going to say, okay, where are the blockages? What's preventing this from being able to move forward so that some communities aren't facing these burdensome practices and policies? And then which policies can we sort of influence uh, and change or adjust so that certain communities and certain blocks of people don't feel the service calls in this burdensome way that they currently are. So that's sort of how you're always connected in the sense that it may not look the same for housing. It may be two parking spaces for housing, but for policing, it could be the difference between uh, the, the connector would be that the mental health building on the lot that can't get the funding because of the two parking space rule or something like that. You see how it's really kind of adjacent, but connecting in that way. Hey, Dominique, Roger here. I'd just like to make one quick comment also, because I know when we talked about citizen engagement, we had listed business and residential surveys. One thing that we offer also is we have people trained in crime prevention through environmental design. And when the River Bluffs Education District or the Goodhue County Education District built the River Bluffs School up by the high school, uh, we were involved in some of the initial planning there to help identify landscaping and just building layout trends that would help reduce the potential for being the victim of a crime which therefore would also reduce the cost of law enforcement response later on. So I just wanted to share that since we're talking about housing, because um, 
that's something we offer to builders or anything. When they're constructing a building, we're willing to help and participate in that to help reduce that potential of, uh, how you say, miss uh, laying out a building or having dark areas or the landscaping being non-conducive to preventing crime. Thanks. That's important because what people aren't realizing as well is once you identify where service calls are coming from, where the officer initiated activity is happening, what is the community center perspective, and you're looking at the policies, when you provide an alternative, you want to make sure that you're thinking about the urban design of the community. Because if a community is sort of um, designed in a way that doesn't create spaces for community-centered resources to thrive, that is why law enforcement has a carbon footprint in that space. And so with that, Michelle, I really want to get us into doing some of the service call stuff so that we can sort of take it from theoretical into practical and people can feel like they're understanding all of these concepts and theories that we're throwing at them. Yep, we are right on time. So, um, Melissa, um, if you give me it one more time, very briefly, um, we'll just, again, this is probably four slides. And if everybody can kind of start to grab your, your pencil or your pen, um, we'll start getting into that. Um, can you see this slide right now? No. Yes. Can somebody answer me? <laughs> Do you see a no, slide up no. on the screen? No. Oh, okay. This is why Melissa's gonna, um, Melissa, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Do I have? You have uh, the power, yep. Hit your share button at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, just it should say Michelle Lisey is starting oh. to share content, but we don't see that yet. So I think you I see. see. I see, I got it, okay. Okay. How about, this is why I really wish we were in the same space. How about now? Can you see? Yes. Well, oh, thank yeah. you, Juan. I see Juan because everybody's so small when I'm sharing this, but I can see. Um, okay, so. So if you all haven't looked at it or read it, please do. This is um, something we've sent out the last couple of meetings. It's called the Roadmap for Exploring New Models of Funding Public Safety. The document's also on the webpage. If anybody asks you about it, they can definitely go and take a look at it. But the first step, and CPE, uh, Center for Policing Equity, uses this and has come up with this. And the first step really says finding out what services might replace or assist law enforcement in some capacity. Why? And there are these three buckets. Really, it's to help take some of the burden off the shoulders of police so they're allowed to do their most important work. Second is to allow for other community experts and to, to play a role and to better serve all the community members in their time of need. And the um, Can I chime in really quickly yeah. just to sort of add back into that? So one of the things that people are always wondering is like, well, if we pull this off of policing purview, what does this mean for a violent crime? Or what does this mean for this? Or what does it mean for that? When you have asked law enforcement to move into a space of providing enforcement on things that are not crime. So thinking of things like traffic tickets or um, I'm, I'm trying to think like mental health, substance abuse, um, chasing dogs, uh, taillights out, um, just things that your your things that will sort of criminalize poverty is what I like to sort of call them. If you are spending a lot of capacity and manpower for folks to be stop gaps for the lack of government support in community centered services and resources, you're not allowing the department to actually be proactively good at the things that the department was originally intended to do, solve crime um, and really protect citizens from violent crime. You also are not allowing folks to determine how and when departments show up if departments have been asked to be a member of the community to sort of do public safety. So how is that equitable if you are telling 
communities that people are going to protect and enforce, but you're not allowing them to be a part of the process. And so really understanding why this dynamic has sort of come to exist happens at the first step with understanding calls for service. Because if we're picking up, we've socialized 911 as a number to call for assistance, but why? Why is that the case? Is it working? Who does it serve? Why does it serve? And if all of these things are sort of detrimental or burdensome to the community members that are under this jurisdiction, you should have the capacity and the ability to make these changes and make these demands for things to be adjusted to meet your needs. And so this is really what the roadmap comes out of. It's helping communities to leverage the information that's available to them to be able to make the informed recommendations and decisions around how public safety should be in their jurisdiction. Back to you, Michelle, sorry. <laughs> oh, no. no, 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 that's good. I just was kind of going a little past there. Um... So the first step, and really, uh, Dominique's already said this, you know, and you all know, it's it's really looking at what the service demand is. What are we asking our police to do? What are they spending their time doing? Um, oops. We're almost done here. 30 more seconds. Um, so we're going to study data tonight. We're going to continue to study data over the course of the project. Uh, Dominique has kind of laid it out. It's basically calls for service to the police from us as a community and then officer initiated activity that comes specifically from the officer, uh, two different ways of looking at it. And this will help inform you all and the rest of the community as you know, we start to have those conversations about how do we put our resources into public safety so it can be better for the officers, it can be better for the community, it's really better for everybody um, is the goal. So we can get to the map. Um, and we're going to kind of tag team here a little bit and then Dominique's going to jump in. Obviously, she's going to lead us through a whole discussion after this. I'm going to be the bingo reader. And so you're just going to basically hear some numbers from me. Um, Melissa, we can, um, I'm going to stop sharing this and we'll just go back to Melissa. You can take it from here on out the rest of the time. So we can see everybody. If you can grab your um, your grid, this little mapping activity grid, if you've got it, if it's across the room or whatever, try to grab it. Got your pen or pencil. And you don't need to look at your map yet, but hopefully you've got your map nearby. Okay. And we're gonna kind of, Roger and I'll kind of tag team. We're gonna, this'll be kind of how it goes. We're gonna do these for eight. Eight different types of calls for service. We'll see how our time is and we'll we'll give this a whirl. And these eight, so that people know there are more calls for service, but these eight are important when you're thinking about reducing the footprint of law enforcement in service in service areas where you can find an alternative person or entity to take care of that. So let's say mental health. When you call the fire department, the fire department shows up. When you call for mental health, mental health experts should show up. When you're calling for a medic, medics show up. So these particular service calls are calls that we have sort of identified as spaces where law enforcement does not have to show up because there are other resources available that could be an alternative. And so I wanna be very clear. I know that there was sort of confusion or, or not confusion, but sort of little trepidation around the data and how the data was being shown and presented. These were selected with Michelle and I and Chief because these have been identified as spaces where there are alternative community resources and supports that could show up. Now, I don't know how robust those are in Red Wing. That's for us to determine and decide and make recommendations on. But if you think automatically about this call for service, you probably could identify in your mind some entity or organization or community member that could show up in place of an officer in some respects. And so that's what we wanna be taking a look at to think about. It's not saying that it's true, it's not we need to do more investigation, but these have been identified as spaces and places where if we did a little bit more deep dive, it could be that we could reduce the law enforcement footprint in this way. 
not saying it will happen tomorrow or today, could be, it's a possibility. And there are probably more than this too, but we, we didn't know for time. So if everybody can take the first page and you'll see like on number three, like your third, we'll get, we'll get good at this, but go down to your third um, row and it's got the letter A with a colon, okay? This would be better if we're all in one room, but since we're not, that A just stands for activity. It's what activity officer was called for. So just write the word domestic, okay? We're gonna cover domestics. And each time we're gonna do this, I'm gonna toss it to the chief and Roger will kind of give us just a really brief exam um, definition, I guess you could say, um, about what a domestic is really short, and then we'll go into the numbers. But it's good as we're writing them down, what does it mean? Because I honestly, I had to ask. I know what I think a domestic is, but what by law, what by law does a domestic mean? Roger, do you want to kind of lead us through that? Hey, sure. Uh, just to try to give it a, a simple, quick definition is a domestic is a, uh, how do you say, a hostile, heated, disagreement between two members that share a type of relationship. So they're either family members, um, have significant uh, intimate relationship. They may be roommates, but there is some type of relationship that connects them to each other as a domestic. Uh, just being friends alone does not make it a domestic. It would be some type of habitat relationship usually is how it looks at. Okay, thanks. So um, you'll see that we've got the, the years listed there underneath your word, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19. We realized we've really, we had easy access to the last four. So under 2006, just forget about 2015 for now. Ro Roger does have all this information. It's all on the website. You can go deep dive into any of this if you want. But under 2016 for domestic, just write the number 147. There were 147 domestic calls to the police in 2016. In 2017, they had 215 calls. In 2018, there were 217 calls. And in 2019, there were 193 domestic calls to the police. So kind of looking at those four years, I just to kind of give you an idea of what, what a trend is, where the numbers are. Okay, so we're not done yet. If you take a look at your word domestic, go to the right, directly to the right of domestic, and you'll see it's got area one, two, three, four, all the way to 12. I'm going to give you a number and you're going to put them in those boxes. So forget about the years now and we're just moving horizontally. We'll do this once and you can ask me at the end of this one if you got any questions. Okay. So to the right of domestic, but right under the box that says area number one, just put a number one. And under the box that says area number two, there were seven calls. These are areas of our community divided up by quote unquote neighborhoods. Area three had 20 calls. Area four had, and this is all for 2019. Area four had 43 domestic calls last year. Area five had 18. Area six had 33 calls. Area seven had 51 calls. Area eight had 18 calls. Area nine had one call. Skip area 10 for a second. Area 11 had zero and area 12 had one. Okay, so that is a stick. Um, and I can tell you right here, and area 10, uh, area 10 also has zero. So let's just pause there before we do a bunch more and see, did everybody kind of get, like, did you write numbers in the boxes where you think they went? Give me a thumbs up if, uh, Michael, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Could you repeat area 
four through six for me, please? Sure, sure. Um, area four had 43 domestic calls. Area five was 18. And area six was 33. And then area seven was 51. This is in one year and it's the last year, 2019. <clears throat> I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so we're supposed to put it in the boxes across from 2019? Or you, you could do that. You, you could do it any way you want, really, Alexis, as long as you're just kind of going horizontally and under the right area number. And that probably makes more sense to do it under 19. I just, you could also do it at the very top, right across from, I don't know if you can see that, right across from that word. Okay. See what I mean? Yeah. Thank you. So it kind of gives you an idea of what the trend is and then what these areas are. Uh, Dominique, would you like us to go through all eight and then take a look at the map and see how they shake out? I wanted to do that, but I know people are probably curious, like, what does this actually mean? Okay. So I will let, I don't want it to be derailed because I do want us to get through all of this. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask for two people. What does this mean? Because someone who's not from Red Wing, I'm looking at this map and I'm putting stuff in based upon what you're seeing from your lived experiences in Red Wing, is this matching up with what you what you thought or know or not? And let me just tell quickly before anybody, like for people who are looking, you know, from the public, we have this map. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. And it divides up by space. And so, yeah, just like Dominique said, do you have some that's yeah, what the numbers correlate to. They correlate to neighborhoods on the map. So you can maybe let us know if you're surprised or. So Doug had a, an answer question. It's not so much a lived experience, but just looking at the map and where the numbers are higher, it seems to correlate where there'd be as higher densities of people. Um, yeah. You know, population wise, these uh, areas that have the higher numbers, just that, that seems to be where you're going to have more households and maybe make some sense to have. More Which area? Which area for you was the most surprising or or sort of confirm what you thought in terms of high density? Because this is domestic. So, like, give me an area. I'm looking on the map now, so I want to just sure. go along. I mean, so sure I'm four, learning. six, seven are the highest numbers four, of six, domestics. Seven. Those areas also, at least my understanding of the city, uh, correlate to where you have just more uh, housing. You just have okay. more people there versus the five has less because it's downtown, a lot of housing okay. These other numbers you get into the edges of town where there's just more space, um, okay. less dense housing units. Gotcha. And it looks like Sam will take that and then we gotta jump into the next one. So we're gonna take comments for each one, just so you know. Um, what immediately jumped out to me was area um, five okay. on how small of a what are the what are we calling it an area it's a very very small area but it still has 18 calls at least on the map it looks small maybe there's more people shoved into one area and that's um, downtown according to the map right the blue five right yeah the east downtown yep downtown area i don't know because uh, the map just looks a little weird to me in general, but I also wanted to mention that um, number two also is a. What about the map? Looks I would consider to, it to be um, a more wealthier area of town. Okay. And, that and what be... about the map looks weird to you? I'm curious. Just kind of how it's separated. Like what? Um, why is it separated into into these areas? I guess. Like, why is number five area five so small compared to area seven, and they're right next to each other? What? Where is the cutoff mark? Why? Why are these areas? Does that make sense? Yeah. No, Michelle, I think would be better able to answer that one. <laughs> I think Roger might be better. I think I don't I don't know. I think that's a really, really, really good question. Um, I don't know. It could be history. Are they it literally could be history of this is way. Roger, do you do you know? 
Well, it's, yeah, this was created long before I got here. Uh, but the way it looks to me is it kind of fell along a natural boundary, a major roadway, you know, like uh, West Avenue is one, uh, 7th Street, 61, Hallquist. Uh, it kind of falls along those areas where I think it was easier to lay out. And then possibly then from natural boundaries, trying to look at populations, because as it was pointed out, you get out in the Cannon Bottoms, that's quite a large area, which is more uh, housing further apart from each other. And whereas some of our smaller areas have more densely housing close to each other. Uh, area five is strictly a downtown business district or quite a bit of it is district. It's between, um, I wanna say Plum Street, I believe it is and and west so it's there's some apartments there up above the businesses but a, a great area of that is also where some of our bars are located which may indicate some of our numbers also so i have a question for you chief so if you call so let's say someone dials 911 and they say 911 i have a domestic well you guys code it as a domestic are they saying i have a domestic in district seven or zone seven, or are they giving you the address and this map is then used to code it as district seven or yeah, district five? Yeah, dispatch usually will call in at say like on a certain street, they may say uh, 200 block of seventh street and they were called in uh, loud yelling and shouting with things breaking in the next door apartment or something like that. It's it comes in different at different times, but it could be, usually it's started by loud noises and arguing. And so then what would happen is, is that when it's coded as a service call, it gets pinged into, let's say it was for the downtown area, it gets pinged in, that call came from area five because you marked that as the boundary for that, given this historical map. Yes, yes, in okay. our, in our uh, GIS mapping that the dispatch has, uh, all of the addresses are coincided with uh, uh, the boundary or the like the DT 05s or the for downtown 05 area. And is this uh, this mapping system that is used? When was it implemented, or who implemented it? Like, does it is this something that was created by policy, or is this just something that can't change? And and I, I'm asking that these probing questions mostly because I know people are thinking about this map and I'm seeing all the confused faces like why this map so I'm asking you in terms of thinking about if this is how things are coded is there a possibility that that could be adjusted or changed in any way given a recommendation or is this just the system that everybody uses for the state given a certain policy or law that has been put in place does that make sense my I'm, articulating that properly. Yeah, no, I understand what you're asking. And I, I really don't know. I'd have to ask the former chief that yeah. because I think this was created when he was part of the department. Um, my thought is it could possibly be open to adjustments if we could figure out a way to more equitably represent each of the reporting areas. Um, but for right now, I know I've tried to look at also voting wards. How would this line up with our city council wards and uh, area representations if we tried to lay one map over the other? Gotcha. Something to think about, guys. Um, Liz, I see you. Barely. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're on mute up there. Sorry, yeah, I'm, my co-pilot had to unmute me because I'm doing all the legal things driving Chief Bowman. Um, I'm wondering if part of the way the map was designed is in plots, like, you know, the C word edition, that type of thing, because when you read your, you know, your abstract, neighborhoods are indefinite plots or additions already. So that might be one way too that they, you know, it's historical that they came up with it. And once well, they I get too bogged down on that, but I did just want to flag that because given sort of the, the temperature checks on your faces, 
I want to do this exercise because seeing where these these sort of numbers overlay, it is possible that if you make recommendations, it could look different as you are sort of making these recommendations about the service calls and where they're going because you're seeing that this map has a particular subset of too much overlay for service calls, but it could look different if it were stretched out or this was more, this was less. So that's what I'm getting at overall. So just something to think about. But Michelle, do you wanna to go to the next one? Yeah. The other thing too that we could do potentially, if it is helpful, I'm not sure, is to look at what the, um, we could find what the percentage of the population is in each of these. I know, um, so it was brought up, you know, some of them are more people, some are broader, and maybe that's why too, I'm not sure, but we could, we could look at that. Um, okay. Yeah, let's do that. Let's okay. do part of, part of, let's do that. And we can put that in the, the note section so that everybody can have that to sort of, once we give all the service calls go through, then people can put the populations to it themselves and get a, a picture. Okay. Is that helpful for folks? Yes, no. All right. Cool. Okay. Michelle, take it away. Okay, so the next one, it's under um, row number 11, and next to that A for activity, you can just write sexual assault, and that's what we'll cover now. And um, I'll read the 2016, 17, 18, 19, and then maybe after that, Chief Pullman can kind of give us a, a definition of what, you know, what the lead, what this falls under. So under sexual assault, go under the 2016, not 15, but 16, there were 31 calls to the police in 2016. In 2017, there were 29 calls. In 2018, there were 31. And in 2019, there were 38. And we'll go through the areas in a minute. Um, but Chief, could you give us a couple minutes on what, what that constitutes or how that's labeled or, you know, whatever you think is beneficial for us to, to know. Okay. Yeah. As far as the definition of sexual assault, I mean, this is one of the more emotional and stressful calls that uh, you go on because of the damage it does emotionally to the victim. Uh, sexual assaults are kind of a broad category that covers there's anything from a um, what some would consider a, a, a full rape to uh, fondling and touching um, uh, of an individual's private areas. So uh, sexual assaults in our community, the great majority of these, I am sad to say, are uh, minors. Uh, juveniles uh, probably make up the majority of our calls in this category, but there are a few adults, but um, I guess that's, if anybody's got questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but that's kind of just a little short answer, I think, of what this category covers. Sam looks like she has a question. Um, I was just curious about, because these numbers for throughout the whole year are, I mean, they're pretty high considering that's a horrible thing to even think about, but because there isn't as many in this section of um, calls for service, how many do we know if there, how many of these are repeat offending or repeat offender calls or um, the repeat victims that maybe had to call more than once or I don't know if I'm making any sense. <laughs> No, no, that's you're making good, uh, very good sense, Sam. And that's uh, no, I don't think we have it separated out by any repeat offenders. Now, some of these may be uh, older calls. Statute of limitations runs from the time it's brought to the attention of law enforcement. So these could have happened 15, 20 years ago that might have just got reported. Uh, also, uh, I see Sarah on here, so I, I want to make sure I recognize a, these calls. We also contact advocates right away so that the victim does have an advocate there to help, um, I guess, provide some type of comfort and also try to help us. Uh, the last thing we want to do in these situations is re-victimize the victim. So 
we want to make sure we handle these appropriately. And to do that, we have advocates that assist. And then also, uh, if they involve juveniles, our Good Hugh County Social Services Juvenile Division are involved in every single interview or any contacts that, that we make so that we make sure we're doing it properly. And um, yeah, because these are one of the most, I guess, sensitive calls that we handle. I have a question for you, Chief. Um, and then I saw Sarah and Michael. So when you get these calls and they come in through dispatch, do you automatically call an advocate or when is the advocate brought into the process and sort of how do you all, is it a handoff to the advocate? Could you walk a little bit through that process? Um, just sort of where your agency begins in this process and then where you would sort of do the off ramp to the advocate. Um, I think I'm curious to know about that process in Red Wing. Yes, uh, yeah, the advocates, uh, normally not called until after the initial investigation or the initial contact is made uh, just because of the variations or the the range that may have occurred. We want to make sure we understand uh, exactly what level of sexual assault that we're dealing with and then uh, go from there. Now, there's also, I believe, and Sarah may uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, sexual assaults are probably a grossly underreported crime because the victim doesn't want to look uh, vulnerable or that they fell for something that they're embarrassed or they may feel that they um, maybe had some involvement in it happening to them. So, you know, I think these numbers are, are probably low uh, when we look at uh, reality out there and um, but I know for the advocates yes definitely on the more severe traumatic ones uh, I forget which area the hospital's in but I know some of these also come in to us through the hospital uh, from the emergency room uh, when somebody stops in there so gotcha thank you so I saw Sarah Michael Doug Liz I see this is the service call that's, that's getting people. I'm, I'm seeing you, your wheels are turning about how you can sort of help the chief think about this process. So this, this is good. I'm seeing the brains turn. All right, Sarah. Um, so just quickly, I can, I could do it during this meeting, but I want to focus. I can get the numbers of advocacy. I can tell you that the numbers that were given, the 30s and the 29 are grossly under what advocacy is providing in Red Wing. So I can either bring those numbers to the next meeting if people think that that would be helpful, um, or I can send them to Michelle if you next want Next meeting, because I feel like this one is something that we want to pry into around recommendations for alternate solutions or alternate supports. Um, so and I also, I'll, oh, sorry, Dominique. No, so yeah, so I would encourage you, do you all, we can talk more about it, but I think next time that would be good to dive into. Okay, and I can bring the numbers actually for domestics as well. So I can give both of those numbers for advocacy um, for what's being provided. Um, I also wanna say that I have worked in alternative ways of providing, working with law enforcement and advocacy that I would like to bring to Red Wing. I, it is a fantastic service and the county that I started it in started expanding out and providing trainings to counties outside of it. And I have law enforcement who would be willing to come in and do training. And the model is fantastic and came out of Oregon. So when we do dive into this, I just want to say I have resources and lots and lots of ideas. I've been in this field for over 10 years. So glad you stepped up. We were going to call you out because the <laughs> chief had mentioned you and sort of thinking about alternatives to these particular calls for service. So chief already acknowledged you. I was just waiting for you to call yourself out. So yes. Um, Can I just ask Sarah a question? Yeah. Did you say it came out of Oregon? Yeah. Is it, I was gonna actually bring up Oregon earlier about cahoots. Um, if anybody had any information on that, but we can get into that at a later date. I just heard you say Oregon. I wanted to know if it had any relation to Eugene, Oregon. Um, 
Actually, yes, I do believe it's out of Eugene. It's called You Have Options is what the program is called. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think the program I had heard about was called CAHOOTS. Um, I can't remember the exact term that it stands for, but it's like helping out on the streets or something. Um, it's a popular program and the model does come from, from Oregon. So we can put that into sort of an alternative when we're thinking about expanding from now that we know what calls for service are, where are the resources that we can plug in and sort of partner with to think about sustainable supports outside of law enforcement or with law enforcement in and how we support that. So thank you. Acknowledging that comment. Michael, do you want to chime in? And I think Doug, I think I saw your hand as well. well and Liz, maybe gonna confirm what uh, she almost saying about come I work in the ER. That's my the thing that I'm reasonably not bad at. And um, that's is something we definitely do when these cases come in um, as part of our mentor reporting and other obligations. Um, so that it's not super common uh, out of the year here uh, for a lot of places, but definitely something we're reporting at least if it came out of the year. Gotcha. Anybody else? Liz. Wait, where'd she go? Oh, maybe she'll be back. When she comes back, I'll tell her if she can chat. But let's go ahead for time's sake, Michelle. And do you want to go ahead and give the the areas for it for 2019? I'm back, Dominique. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, sorry, I just that bad reception on I-90. Um, Chief Holman, I just have a quick question. There was about fourteen thousand calls last year. When you're when you're at a are these are those all single classified calls? For instance, if let's say that mom catches dad fondling their eight year old daughter and she calls the police and then she's getting beat up by dad when the police get there, is that a domestic and a sexual assault? Or is every call just one classification? And that came up to the 14,000. Was there actually 14,000 calls, or do some have multiple classifications? No, they would have the primary call given to dispatch. So um, for that scenario that you gave, we would call that a uh, sexual assault response. And then even though it broke into a domestic after we were there, that would be secondary, but it wouldn't wouldn't be listed on the initial calls for service list. Okay, so the calls, if, even if there's two or three classification, those were 14,000 calls, actual calls that you went out for. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's a lot of calls. Um, <laughs> I'm going to note that in the notes, though, that maybe, because what you're saying, Chief, sounds, um, it is an interesting question. How do we categorize and how do we show the data? You know what I mean? Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have mental illness. We've got the head. Wait, no, we have to, we have to do oh. before we go back, got to put the numbers in for 2019 for uh, sexual assault. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> we do have to get cruising. Okay. So the 2019 numbers are for area one, zero, area two, one, area three had nine, area four had 10, area five had two, area six had two, area seven had six, area eight had one, area nine had four calls, Area 10 had one call and area 11 and 12 had zero. And maybe just, I, I don't wanna, um, we, we can't get way off track, but just so that people, you know, 11 and 12, 11 is Treasure Island um, Casino and then 12 is Prairie Island. Um, I think Roger mentioned today as we were going through these numbers that Correct me if I'm wrong, the casino has its own security and then Prairie Island, of course, has its own police department. So sometimes these numbers will be low um, 
right, Chief? Am I am I saying this right? But it's be, it's because our City of Red Wing Police Department hasn't handled those calls, correct? Oh, that's yeah. correct. We have an agreement where we'll respond and assist them with a call, but those will show up under assist other agency. Um, if they're out of the area doing a transport or something else where they ask us to handle a call, uh, then Red Wing officers might be primary on the scene at the casino, but that's rare. Okay. So if, if there are zeros in a lot of those 11 and 12, I'm not saying they're, yeah. So just letting you know. Okay. Should we move on to mental illness, Dominique? Yeah, let's try to at least, because we had eight of them, right? So this would be four. Yeah, we may yeah. not get through all of them, but let's try yep. to get through at least mental health first. Yeah. So um, it's categorized as mental illness. Um, like, or whatever that's what, and so 2000. So if we just put under the A, at least this is how it's categorized. Maybe. I don't know if that's a state label or not, but it's categorized as mental illness. For 2016, there were 37 calls. 2017, there were 55 calls. In 2018, there were 81 calls. And in 2019, there were 84. So that did Sam, happen. this is where cahoots would come in, where we could start looking at, at, at that service um, when it comes to mental illness or mental health. And Chief, can you kind of tell us how does it fall under that or how does that get categorized, I guess, under that? Maybe so we know. Yes. Know it's and, hard. and, you know, some of these are difficult, too, because some of them may be drug induced um, and drug related. Uh, but normally they get initially called in, um, say somebody acting strangely in the park, uh, yelling or talking themselves or uh, just things that don't feel right. Or we'll get a call that so-and-so is talking, he's not making sense and I'm concerned. Um, you know, this, these come in in a, a wide range of different types of call, but it's, it's kind of generated through abnormal behavior that they just are concerned about and not acting properly. Uh, there's a few that I know personally because I was I had responded to a couple that um, involved uh, individual just screaming obscenities at people across the street uh, from an alley. So it, it ranges quite differently, but. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll answer any questions that somebody might have on this. I have a question. So training officer Corey, um, when these calls come through, what do you feel is an officer's best line of support? So let's say if we're thinking about how community can support this process and reducing the footprint or sort of supporting in any way that community resources that are dealing with mental illness could support where would that show up or how how do you feel that a community resource could be helpful or in the line of work that you're seeing what do you feel would be beneficial in any way if you're looking at this because the conversation is always let's move mental health away from law enforcement purview let's do this let's do this how do you see that showing up in red wing in a way that could be supportive to the work that you do There we go. Sorry about that. Um, it's a tough one. Um, a big question, obviously, that uh, why I'm kind of excited to be a part of this because I haven't really looked at it from that angle. Um, me personally, mental health calls have been a great opportunity to build a rapport with community members that are struggling and built relationships. Um, trying to think of some examples back, you know, meeting people when they have minor issues and building that relationship with them then later on when they have a larger issue, it's much easier resolved. Um, and we're able to stop it from turning to a use of force, I guess, just off of that relationship that we have. Reaching out to other resources, we don't really have them. So I guess I don't know where we would reach out to other than the ER. Um, so I don't know where we would go with that, but um, personal experience, the majority of the calls are either parents calling for kid, 
uh, juvenile that is having mental health issues or drug induced typically. Um, and that's sometimes the victim who's calling, um, saying they're seeing stuff or they're not feeling right and they want help. Um, typically we would bring them to the hospital if that's what they want, it would be up to them. So I guess I'm, I'm all ears as far as other options to talk about. But one of the things, like I said, is I would be scared of not having involvement because I've always enjoyed that opportunity to build those relationships when we're talking about these calls for service. Thank you. It looks like Sarah and Doug have something to say. Thank you for turning off the court. Officer Gray, I just had a quick question. You said that you, there aren't a lot of resources. Isn't there a 24 hour crisis response, mobile crisis response, and do they come? I've heard that they exist, but I've never like ha called them myself or referred to anyone. So I don't know if that is a resource that can be utilized. Liz will know. Yes. Yeah, so oh. I, I applaud. There, there's tons of numbers and information out there. I guess typically from my experience, it's if people are calling for help, they want to go to the hospital. They want to go to the ER. Um, it's very rare that when we offer numbers and stuff like that, that they've taken advantage of that. They just say, I want to go to the ER. Um, whether it's a medication issue or it's a um, drug issue, I don't know if it's just because that's the most commonly known or ex if they've had experience there, et cetera, but that's the most common route that we go, I guess. Thanks. Liz, Doug, I saw you. Liz, Corey K. Chime in um, as you all feel free. I guess that was interesting when you, um, you know, um, Officer Corey, that they don't know where to refer because Hiawatha Mental Health is the mental health agency in town. It's, I mean, it's who I work for. All of our clients, we give them the mobile response when we, you know, we sit down with them when we first get them, do the mobile response, give them the crisis number and those type of things, and set up a safety plan with them. So um, we use mobile response, or our clients use mobile response for like, you know, times like this. I'm not going to be at work for a couple of days. So my clients all know if they need help there to call mobile crisis. Um, it's very active in Goodyear County. Um, it's very, I mean, it's in all the counties around us, you know, and there's a mobile team that is ready to be dispatched either just virtually um, on the phone or, or will go in person. Um, and Hiawatha Mental Health is always has their door open for referrals if there's somebody who, you know, um, obviously they need more, more uh, either like what I do, adult rehabilitative mental health, therapy, those type of things. So there's, there is a strong community partnership willing to work with the police department in our community. So that needs to happen. <laughs> so that's, yeah, so that's, that's a conversation too that I think. So Liz and Sarah look like they're our guest stars for our next call. Um, just sort of as we can partner and think about how it seems to be opportunity gaps for collaboration here in, in that space. So we'll say that, but I do want to give Corey Kay and Doug a chance to speak. I know we're running up to time, so I want to give do that. I just wanted to do a real uh, quick. Department. Um, can you talk louder, Corey? Sorry, you got to like yell oh, yeah. into it so we can hear you. I'm uh, sorry about that. Uh, can you hear me now? Um, oh, this is, uh, oh, sorry. Um, we've had good interactions with um, individuals who had a, like a family member called the police department because they were missing. Um, they have deal with Alzheimer's or different issues. And the nice thing about police department is they have eyes on the street and they can help locate these people quickly um, versus some of the you know other crisis lines where they might have to pull resources together. One of the one of the key things where um, you know quickly they can get out there, they can find this individual and help bring them back home or get them resources when they're they're not a violent threat. They're just maybe have wandered off and and uh, need someone to help do a locate um, or just do a yes. That's kind of just... thanks. All right, Doug, you want to jump in so we can? Yeah. Um, so um, as a being in the ER, I'm usually on the receiving end of. Um, a lot of these calls and then Liz, I'd be very interested in learning more about these resources uh, being here for a few years now, not totally familiar with that. They come to our doorstep, we deal with it from there, but um, throughout there, our police department here does a better job than most I've worked with in the past in dealing with 
um, these patients, varying from the, the maybe slightly depressed person to the overtly psychotic, which, uh, as uh, Chief Pullman had mentioned, could be drugs not infrequently here or uh, lack of medication. Those are sort of the two main things you'll see no matter where you go that, that cause those overt psychosis, like that person you mentioned, yelling obscenities. Um, but overall, just for everyone's information, and you maybe you already knew this, mental health is a, a huge disparity uh, nationwide. I've, I've not worked in a state yet that has adequate mental health resources um, to, to keep people functioning well. Uh, so uh, hopefully Liz can give us some more ideas here on what to go, but uh, also don't be surprised that it's just a shortage as far as general funding for mental health um, that creates this kind of ongoing uh, issue. Thank you for sharing. So, Michelle, do you want to take us home in terms of getting the Steve numbers? Steve looks like he's got. Oh, I co completely miss you. Sorry there, Steve. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. I'm just curious on these calls you respond to, how many, uh, if you've got just a rough percentage, uh, are after hours, and what percentage of those could you wait for assistance? Uh, from a social worker or somebody else uh, to come and help. Gotcha. Cool. Well, I, guess, I guess Corey and I are kind of teaming on this seat. one. But uh, yeah, I would say the majority of the ones for us are after hours because otherwise they have their therapists and their um, wherever they're a client at during the daytime at readily available to get in or to check in um, in those situations. So exactly weekends, I would say are some, but to put a hard number on it, I would, I would struggle to do that. Okay. Should we do one more quick one? It's Dominique or not. This is suicide wow. attempts and threats. So it's kind of a sad one, but it's, I don't know if we should end on that. Uh, Michael okay. looks like he has something to say. Michael. I, okay, because then there is there is another one that we could not even go all the way through. But if you did want to know some of the other, we just have the number of calls. You know, which all right, is so kind here's, of interesting. Here's what I think we should do since we're up at time, and I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to do this exercise. And for the folks at home who want to do it as well, materials will be on the website. I think that everybody should finish this activity. So we're, because a lot of people are asking for percentages. So Michelle and I can sort of work together to get you the percentages so that you can then come with your completed map next time. So we'll start with everybody coming with their completed map with their percentages and their 2019 um, numbers. Then what we're going to do on the off time is work with the chief, um, Turning off to Corey, Liz, and Sarah to talk about alternatives and figure out what are the pathways to some of these things that you all have been bringing up with regards to how does this look if people don't show up at 2 a.m.? What does it happen on the weekends? How does this happen? What services are happening in the community that the, the department doesn't know about? What policies are in place there? So we're going to sort of queue that up for you all for the next conversation so that we can review the service calls overall from the map an activity that you'll finish with the percentages and then be able to start expanding into, okay, so what does an ideal situation look like when it comes to um, calls for service? So that's having nobody assigned to it at this point. We'll be thinking about it in terms of if I call 911 and say, I'm calling for a domestic, what are the possibilities of support? And so we want to like think about that. So let's take it away from thinking about who owns it to more of what does it look like if no one owned it? Who, how do we connect the dots to make communities feel that they have resources and supports to do to make the call? Is that helpful? Does that make sense? Are we, are you hearing what I'm saying so that we can start building into then where we would be? Okay, now that we've thought about this, we've looked at the service calls, here's a recommendation city council. Now that we've explored what it looks like if I were to pick up the phone for 911 in the city of Red Wing and say, I'm having a mental health crisis right now. What does that look like? 
that's ultimately what we're hoping to get at. And that's what we mean by the recommendations. And so the recommendations would inform, you know, when I call this number, this is what I'm hoping to get out of this experience as a community member in Red Wing, given all of the systems that are here to, that are designed and supposed to be helpful to me and my community. So I hope that's helpful. If it isn't, you know where to find me in my inbox. Um, I do listen to what people are saying. I am trying to make this as painless as a process because it is painful for lived experiences and people who have lived experiences that are being forced to take control of conversations and narratives and, and, and sort of learn about this and, and offer up opportunities in a moment that is really painful for a lot of people. And so I do want to acknowledge that as always. I think that we're all here for the right reasons. I think that tonight was really helpful to learn about Red Wing from my perspective because I am an outsider and I do really want to learn more and be a part of the solutions. Um, and again, this is your process. So at any point, if this does not feel productive or helpful or thoughtful, offer some suggestions so that we can make sure that we are meeting your needs to be able to get the information that you need to make the decisions that are going to be directly impacting your livelihood and your, your sort of standing as a citizen of Red Wing. Questions, comments, thoughts really quickly, anything? Michael, Sam? You just got one minute. <laughs> I was just wondering if you could, um, Michelle, email me the rest of the for this mapping activity. You know, it, um, just all the subjects and all the numbers that go with them. So, would you like? Um, would everybody like to? I, I'm looking to you all and to Dominique. How do you want to? Yes, I can definitely do that. Yes, would everybody? Okay, okay. Yeah, everybody also wants percentages as well because everybody's like, this is really small and this is really big. How many people actually live in this space? So that would be helpful to have the percentages to overlay with the 2019 sort of numbers as well as the full 2016 to 2019. And if you have any questions as far as, um, I I know the chief is gone on vacation next week, so I might try to grab them the next couple of days. But if there are overriding questions about how did we get this or what does this mean? You could email me so that we could get those answers to you also. Um, but I will put this in a better um, format than my scribbling and I will get it to all of you. And I think Sam had something to say and then Sarah, and we really got to go because I'm always having you guys stay over and sleep. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that I think that it would be beneficial to, you know, maybe not next meeting, but sometime during this process to um, look into um, what Eugene Oregon has done with the cahoots um, because they have reduced a lot of their their uh, footprint um, by using their that system. Um, and also, I wanted to reach, say something back to what Liz was talking about with the Hiawatha mental health. Um, I'm kind of curious on what resource, I mean, I know, I guess I know what resources are available, but at what costs? Because um, I know that there are some people who probably have mental health issues who aren't even being seen or never being been seen because they can't afford to or don't have um, health coverage or, uh, you know, there's so many different reasons why. Liz is going to show us going to be seen. Mm -hmm. Liz, Liz and Sarah and the chief are going to get together and they're going to present some options for us. So. TBD, okay, yeah, I was the experts in this, so they're going to give us the different options that you guys have been flagging today around concerns or supports that exist already cahoots being 1 of those things that we can look at as well. So. Don't think that we forgot. I took notes on that. Thanks. All right, last Sarah, oh, take us out. Last, wait, oh, wait, wait. Yeah. this was the most important part. I just wanted to say, 
um, happy heavenly birthday to um, George Floyd today. Thank you for that. Thank you for acknowledging that. This is, this is the impetus for why a lot of us are here and, and sort of committed to, to the work. And so thank you for really taking the time to acknowledge that. I think it's a good reminder that we are in this moment to do this work, but there's tons of work to continue. And so we all have to really rely on our willingness to show up and participate in this process. Um, we're all here because we want to make a difference in Red Wing. And so let's stay committed to that. Sarah, do you want to take us out? I think what you said was a perfect take us out and I will send my question and email to Michelle. Sounds good. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for showing up tonight. Go get your food. Go hug on everybody. Good night. Bye-bye.